Tonight, Peter Nygaard found guilty of sexual assault. It's relief, it's victory. After years of allegations, the former fashion mogul now convicted on four counts. We are dealing with a systematic monster who used his business talents for evil. The scene inside court. A Montreal Jewish school shot at again. They wanted to put fear into the community. Condemnation and appeals for calm. Rush frontman Getty Lee opens up about the band's unique success. We were always too quirky. His experience with anti-Semitism. Hate gets you nowhere. And setting the record straight on one of their songs. That was a bee in my bonnet and I got it off my chest. That thoughtful conversation in the breakdown. This is The National with Ian Hennemanse. For decades, he was a celebrated fashion mogul, a powerful Canadian executive. But tonight, Peter Nygaard is a convicted sex offender, a jury finding him guilty of sexually assaulting four women. He was acquitted on a fifth count and a charge of forcible confinement. The verdict, the first conviction after years of allegations against the now 82-year-old, many told to CBC News. Jamie Strachan was in court for the verdict, and he has the emotional reaction. For years, allegations of sexual assault have swirled around Peter Nygaard. Now, he's convicted. This is a battle won in a much bigger war. Therapist Shannon Maroney has worked with dozens of women who've made allegations against Nygaard, including four involved in this case. She shared reaction from one. The verdict is not only for her, the guilty verdict, or for anyone else, but it is shared across all survivors, all women and girls. We did this for everyone, not only for ourselves. Nygaard was found guilty on four or five counts of sexual assault. Many of the allegations in this case stretch back decades and were only recently reported to police. Many of the women told similar stories of meeting Nygaard by chance at a party or on a plane before they were assaulted in a private bedroom suite inside his Toronto headquarters. They didn't report it because they feared Nygaard would ruin their career. The Crown painted Nygaard as a predator who used his power and wealth to lure and abuse women. This is a crime that typically happens in private and profoundly impacts human dignity. To stand up and recount those indignities in a public forum such as a courtroom is never easy and takes great courage. Nygaard's son Kai says he raised suspicions about his father's behavior years ago and was in the courtroom when the verdict was read. I loved my father. It hurts me to see all of these things. I knew a different man, but when you get the reveal that there is another person, there's another personality within there, there's something evil in there, there's something perverse, there's something sick. Nygaard, who testified in his own defense, didn't appear to react to the verdict. His lawyer says he's considering whether to appeal. As you've all seen, Mr. Nygaard is, uh, is frail, has uh, numerous health challenges. Nygaard left court Sunday hunched in the back of a police van, a black parka obscuring most of his face, a shadow of the man who for years was one of the most powerful men in global fashion. And Jamie, what's next for Peter Nygaard? Uh, Ian, still a long uh, legal road ahead for Peter Nygaard beyond this case here in Ontario, facing criminal charges in Manitoba, Quebec, and in New York State. Beyond those criminal charges, also facing a civil suit in the United States involving dozens of women and allegations going back to the 1970s. Ian? Jamie Strachan outside the Toronto courthouse where the Nygaard trial took place. Montreal police are investigating after a Jewish school was shot at for a second time, the latest in a string of attacks on Jewish institutions in the area. As Sarah Levitt shows us, the city's mayor is among those condemning the violence. Worry is building in Montreal's Jewish community. For the second time in just three days, this Jewish school has been shot at. The glass shattered where a bullet went right through the door. It's, it's fear. They wanted to put fear into the community. It's very clear what they want to do. We're not going to stop what we're doing. We're going to go on. Montreal police say they received several calls around 5 o'clock Sunday morning with reports of gunshots and a vehicle fleeing the scene. Officers arrived to the damage and shell casings on the ground. Nobody was injured. 
but after another school was also shot at last week and a synagogue and community center were hit with Molotov cocktails, Montreal's mayor is sending a message. We're talking about an establishment where kids are going. Valérie Plante says the escalation of violence is unacceptable. According to Montreal police, there have been at least 73 acts of hate against the Jewish community and 25 against the Muslim community in the past month. That's equivalent to an eight-month period in 2022. Plante says disagreements about what's happening in the Middle East are inevitable. But we can do this, we can have those conversations with respect and not using fear and absolutely not having uh, this kind of uh, a violent act towards a community. To some, what happened at this school is not just a violent act. For the second time in less than 72 hours, our school, Yeshiva Godola of Montreal, has been the target of a terrorist attack. I say again, a terrorist attack. They want to try and scare us into closing our schools, into not educating our children. They will fail. A community defiant. Classes were quick to begin again and the damage repaired. Police say patrols will be increased in the area. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. More than 100,000 people marched through Paris today condemning a spike in anti-Semitism. The demonstration was called for by leaders of the Senate and National Assembly. More than 1,200 anti-Semitic acts have been recorded in France since the Israel-Hamas war began. Inside Gaza tonight, a dire situation in hospitals. Some say they have closed to new patients because of increasing airstrikes and a lack of fuel and medicine. The World Health Organization says Al-Shifa Hospital, Gaza's largest, is no longer functioning. Battered and out of fuel, doctors say they can do little for patients inside. Israel accuses Hamas of operating underneath the hospital, a claim Hamas denies. The director of Al-Shifa Hospital says three babies have died as conditions deteriorate. Our Barry Stewart spoke with him today and shows images from inside the hospital, including of some babies fighting for their lives. As war rages throughout the embattled neighborhoods of North Gaza, here are some of the most vulnerable. Born into violence that's already killed several thousand. Premature babies no longer in incubators because the hospital is out of fuel. It's Briar Stewart from CBC. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We reached Dr. Mohammed Abu Salmiya, the director of Al Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza. It's now reportedly out of electricity, water, and food. He says three babies have died in the past two days. We wait for any help from military, Israeli military, for us, uh, uh, international uh, Red Cross, uh, from anyone. We need to evacuate. This patient safely in uh, other uh, hospital in Gaza or out Gaza. Israel said it would help evacuate the 37 babies in the neonatal unit, but that hasn't happened yet. And Israel says it isn't to blame. There's no reason why we just can't take the patients out of there uh, instead of letting Hamas use it as a command center for terrorism. The Israeli Defense Forces released this video, which it says shows soldiers dropping off 300 liters of fuel outside the hospital. The director told us that fuel has not been received, and it isn't nearly enough anyway. And it's dangerous for you. No one from the hospital can go and come bring this fuel from the street in this uh, situation. Israel suggested that Hamas was preventing the hospital from getting the fuel. Hamas denies that. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands have managed to make their way out towards the south, where it's supposed to be safer, but there's no sanctuary here. <laughs> Just outside of the city of Han Yunus, 13 people were reportedly killed in an Israeli airstrike. While Israel is facing growing international pressure, including from the EU, to pause fighting amid the mounting death toll, a group of U.S. congressmen came to Tel Aviv to show strong support for a country viciously attacked barbaric. last month. So thank you. The battle thank against terrorism. Barbaric terrorism. It's we're, even worse. We're with you. Thank you. U.S. officials say they're in talks with Qatar, who is in communication with Hamas leaders. They say they're discussing the urgent need to evacuate the critically wounded, as well as to secure the release of the nearly 240 hostages still trapped in Gaza. 
Briar Stewart, CBC News, Jerusalem. More than 230 people with Canadian ties managed to get across the border from Gaza into Egypt today. That is the biggest group yet. And as Tom Perry shows us, so many of those leaving are carrying stories of fear and heartache. After two days sealed shut, the only escape route for foreigners and dual nationals out of Gaza finally restored. More than 200 Canadians passed through the Rafah crossing on this day alone. Canadian officials in Cairo have already processed two groups of evacuees, with many expressing relief at being out of Gaza, but also regret. 14-year-old Kamar Fayad and her 11-year-old brother Amir will soon be headed to B.C. to be with their father, Mohammed. They're looking forward to reuniting with their dad, who they haven't seen in a decade. But life in Gaza was something special. Amir says it was beautiful, going to school, playing soccer with his friends. In charge of the children, their uncle, Maisara Fayad. He accompanied his niece and nephew through the Rafa crossing and now has a Canadian visa to take them all the way to B.C. But making this journey involved a difficult choice. I feel... Uh... Emotional upset. Fayad's own family, his wife and five children, are still back in Gaza. I'm really happy for the kids, so I will be, get them to their, their dad after 10 years. But uh, just worried and uh, feeling so bad about my family in Gaza. So my mind there and my heart there. Fayad says he'll return to his family as soon as he can. He's just not sure when that will be. Tonight, more buses arrived carrying more Canadians who have escaped from Gaza in far greater numbers than ever. With them will come more stories of difficult choices, people fleeing for their lives while leaving so much behind. Tom, this is an incredibly difficult choice uh, the family is making. How are they doing? It, it's an agonizing choice. And, and you know, we, we saw that firsthand tonight while we were talking to the Fayad family, uh, they got a phone call, and it was from their family back in Gaza, and they'd been warned to evacuate, that an Israeli airstrike could be coming. So it was, as you might imagine, a very emotional phone call, and it was just an interesting insight into what people in Gaza are going through and what people who have left people in Gaza are going through, and it's bad. Tom Perry reporting from Cairo. Back in Canada, Edmonton police have released images connected to Thursday's deadly shooting of a father and his son in broad daylight. This video shows the suspects at a gas station in a black BMW SUV in Edmonton South End around noon on Thursday. And that is around the time a 41-year-old man and his 11-year-old son were fatally shot. Police are now trying to determine if it's the same black BMW that was later found burned. Next year's U.S. presidential election could be in for a shakeup. A high-profile senator appears to be testing a possible run for the White House. Voter dissatisfaction for both Joe Biden and Donald Trump is high. And as Katie Simpson explains, that could set the stage for a third-party candidate. On a beautiful afternoon in front of the White House, one way to spoil the mood is ask voters about the next election. Most people would want to see, you know, Joe Biden not run again. Most people want to see Trump not run again. So, but I think it's just unfortunate that's just not really the reality that we're living in. I'm not wildly enthusiastic, but I think that's what we're going to get. I think that they need to, sh you know, maybe get some, I hate to say younger minds in there, but more open minds in there. Okay, guys. Hugh Senator Joe Manchin, who is looking to tap into that voter disappointment. He's sparking intense speculation about a possible third-party presidential run by announcing he will not seek re-election in the Senate. But what I will be doing is traveling the country and speaking out to see if there is an interest in creating a movement to mobilize the middle. The Democrat has not always voted along party lines, making him a favorite of No Labels. No Labels wants to put common sense back on your ballot. A group planning a bipartisan presidential ticket should the vote be a Joe Biden-Donald Trump rematch. There are an awful lot of people that just are looking for some other alternative. 
That could partly explain why controversial independent Robert F. Kennedy Jr. had an unusually high 22 percent support in a recent poll. The vote could also be split by Green Party hopeful Jill Stein and progressive activist Cornell West, another independent. On the Sunday political talk show circuit, one senior Democrat worried about these challengers. Donald Trump has a high floor and a low ceiling, and you throw a bunch of third-party candidates in there, and you are making it much more likely that he wins the election. No Labels is waiting until early March to decide on launching an alternate campaign. By that time, it should be fairly clear who the Republican and Democratic nominees are going to be. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. A Nova Scotia homeowner is going public over his battle to collect thousands from a shady contractor seven years after winning a small claims court case. Rosa Marcatelli explains why it's often so hard for claimants to get their money. Peter Dobson sued his former contractor in small claims court and won after that contractor failed to finish building a second story on Dobson's house. A judge ordered Nelson Gross to pay the homeowner more than $20,000. Seven years later, Dobson is still trying to collect. Quite often having a judgment in small claims court is useless because they issue a so-called court order which is totally ignored and nothing happens. Problem is, there are no enforcement agencies for small claims courts. So those who win are on their own to try and collect if the person they sued doesn't want to pay. Dobson tried to track down his former contractor's assets to try and garnish income bank accounts, put liens on his property. But no luck. He found nothing. Is it complicated? The problem is that when there are people out there that don't want to pay, they can make it very difficult. Go Public reached five other people and companies who have successfully sued the same contractor. None have been paid the more than $173,000 awarded by judges. When we reached Gross to ask him why he hasn't paid, he didn't give us much of an answer. I have no comment about any of that right now. According to Statistics Canada, almost 565,000 small claims court cases were filed in the past four years. Lawyers say make sure someone is able to pay by doing your homework before you sue. Look at what assets they have. It may not be worth it when you do the research. BC is trying to change things. It introduced a new law last month that aims to make it easier for self-represented plaintiffs to collect judgments by giving more power to civil enforcement officers. Too early to say if it'll make a difference. There are no plans for changes in Nova Scotia where Dobson lives. He doubts he'll ever see his money. But he's not giving up on getting justice, he says. He and another former gross customer are posting warnings about the contractor online, compiling complaints against him, hoping that will lead to fraud charges. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip you think the team should investigate, email gopublic at cbc.ca. Iceland is bracing for a volcanic eruption that could wipe out an entire town. What we are seeing now really is an unprecedented event. When it could hit and what's being done to get people to safety. Plus. Oh my God, she did it! Canada has made history in the world of tennis. It feels amazing and I'm extremely proud. How the players are reacting to their stunning victory. And... Closer to the heart, yes, closer to the heart. From frontman to author, Geddy Lee reflects on his time with Ryan. We used to joke, and we would look at one of the songs we just finished and say, hey, you know, that could be a hit if somebody else did it. <laughs> We're back in two. Iceland is preparing for a volcanic eruption tonight. Authorities there warn it's not a matter of if, but rather when. A small town has been evacuated, and a state of emergency is in effect. Philip Lee Shannock shows us the anxious wait. The warnings couldn't be any clearer for residents of Grindavik. Thousands of tremors have hit the town in the past few weeks, now the danger of a catastrophic eruption is apparently imminent. On Saturday, Icelandic authorities began going house to house, making sure the roughly 4,000 residents have moved to safety. 
Many gathered at a shopping mall near the capital, Reykjavik. This man says they came to look each other in the eyes and hug each other and even cry. That has been precious. The fishing town is about 40 kilometers from the capital, close to a volcano that's laid dormant for 800 years before erupting in 2021. It's not just close to the town, but to an international airport that brings tourists to the island nation. The Icelandic Meteorological Office says seismic activity in the area has increased significantly, indicating that this volcano is about to erupt. The town is also in the direct path of an underground lava corridor running to the ocean. The lava pressure so powerful, an eruption could obliterate it. What we are seeing now really is an unprecedented event. We are really talking about um, uh, velocities uh, for this process and volumes or inflow rates that are much higher than what we have been seeing. And there are signs that lava is about to punch through to the surface. The magma is, uh, is now on a shallow, very shallow depth, so we're expecting uh, an eruption within a couple of hours. Uh, shortest part, at least within a couple of days. The shelter worker says, like many, he's preparing for the worst, that his home and everything he owns will be gone. But he adds, life always goes on. Philip Lishanok, CBC News, Toronto. For the first time in the tournament's 60-year history, Canada has won the Billie Jean King Cup. Your new world champions are Canada. The team's historic rise to the top and what it means to young fans. Plus, Giddy Lee opens up about his days on tour and the importance of his upbringing. There's so much about what happened to my family that is being forgotten or rewritten. My interview with the Rush frontman and... From the river to, be free, to the sea, Palestine will be free. It's a controversial chant used in pro-Palestinian protests. I question, where do you see the Jews going? Why some call it racist, while others defend it. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Bursts of color in the sky along riverbanks and city streets as millions across India mark Diwali this weekend. The annual Festival of Light celebrates the triumph of good over evil and festivities run for five days. History was made today on a tennis court in Spain. For the first time, a team of Canadian women are Billie Jean King Cup champions. As Yvette Brend explains, it's not only the premier title for team competition, it's also the most lucrative. Leila Fernandez led Team Canada to victory, defeating her Italian opponent in straight sets, sending her teammates onto the court to celebrate. World champions of Canada! It feels amazing and I'm extremely proud that I was able to get to represent Canada at the biggest stage and to do it in front of Billie Jean, it means the world to, to me, to us. Canada's team gets a record 2.4 million U.S. in prize money. And this is such a special event to play as a team. I think we all get to know each other better and, and really feel patriotic. And so hopefully um, Canadians are watching at home and feel happy for us and happy for the entire country. And we can't wait to put on these jackets, baby. Woo! And blue jackets for each player on the team from the tennis legend herself. And a breakout performance for Marina Stakusic, just 18 years old. A surprise pick for the singles match, she scored a big victory against a much higher ranked player. It's been such an honor being a part of this team and I couldn't be more proud of everyone. Like this has seriously been the best experience ever. She's incredible and uh, you know, the future is looking very, very bright for her. Indeed, the future is looking very bright for all of Canadian tennis. The Canadian men's team will be defending their Davis Cup title later this month. We are really doing well and we are uh, competitive in every aspect of the game. You know, today we made history and just hoping that this inspires a lot, a lot of uh, young girls at home. Uh, you know, to ten Canada wasn't a tennis nation uh, a couple of years ago, and now it definitely is. Yes, go out there and play tennis. <laughs> <laughs> 
so good. She says this dream come true is only the first of many yet to come. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. Now we go deeper into the story shaping our world. A slogan that's chanted at pro-Palestinian protests is called hate speech by some and a call for rights by others. But first, one of Canada's biggest music stars has a lifetime of stories to tell. This is The Breakdown. Rush frontman Getty Lee has a new memoir. He insisted it had to include his parents' story of surviving the Holocaust. I just wanted to remind people that this happened. But it's also about the decades of music. Some of them are like, oh, cringy. From one of Canada's most prolific bands, I sat down with Getty Lee at a classic Toronto venue. One of the reasons, obviously, we chose to do the interview here, we're near Young and Bloor, is that the teenage Getty Lee saw Led Zeppelin in this space. Right there. I mean, that's Second incredible row. to imagine that you, first of all, yeah. were here watching one of the greatest you know, bands at the time and, and of all time. Um, what kind of impact did that have on you? Oh, that had a, a tremendous impact. I can say in all honesty that for me and Alex Lifeson, my, my BFF and my partner in crime for a million years, and also for John Rutsey, who was our drummer at the time, it was a life-changing experience. You know, we sat there in the second row, and uh, Jimmy Page didn't walk on stage. He floated on stage. I'm sure there was a cloud under his feet. And it was such a profoundly intense rock experience. And the rafters were literally shaking, and plaster was literally falling off the ceiling. They really brought the house down. And it was a kind of rock music that we had never really heard or felt in that way. And we went back home as three aspiring young goofs trying to be musicians. And we wanted to be like that. So it, it changed our whole attitude on how we looked at rock music. It really was that profound. We'll come back to talking about music in a moment. But speaking of your book, let's talk about chapter three. Okay. Which was hard to read. It's a, it's a searing account of what your parents as teenagers, I guess, went through in the death camps, uh, the Nazi death camps. And uh, I've been thinking about it a lot since I read it. Well, what impact do you hope that has on people? Okay, so um, one of the things I said to my book agent when I finally did acquiesce and agree to do a memoir was that I had to have a chapter about my parents' experiences because I felt the personality I am, the way I think, the way I look at the world was formed, obviously like everyone else, formed by your childhood experiences. But I grew up listening to these stories that affected me very much. And so that was one reason I was insisting on doing a chapter about their lives. Another reason was I wanted to pay homage to my mother, who I was very close with. But the third is that we're living in such dangerous times, and uh, there's so much about that period and what happened to my family that is being forgotten or rewritten. And I felt I just wanted to remind people that this happened and there were witnesses to it. So for all those reasons, I felt it important to include in, in my, my history. When we were children, my mom would tell us about her experiences in the war. And when our uncles and aunts were over, talk would sometimes turn to theirs as well. It made me angry to hear what they'd seen and suffered at the hands of the Nazis. And when I went up to bed, my rage would boil over into waking dreams. You're here today, as you point out in the book, because your parents, against all odds, managed to survive. Um, it is a reminder of all of that. And it is, I mean, what, what modern day lesson is there for us in that? Well, that's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> We're living in 
uh, incendiary and complicated times. And I just think it's important to remember that hate gets you nowhere uh, and that uh, my people are a minority, uh, even though uh, sometimes we're not treated as a minority for some strange reason. And, uh, you know, anti-Semitism is on the rise and we can't forget history. Um. I don't think of Rush as a, as a political band, um, but recently uh, the Rush Instagram account made a post about the, and I think the word sort of monstrous attack by Hamas into Israel, but also um, the, again, a quote, innocent souls in Gaza who are also uh, suffering. Um, a lot of people want to stay away from, you know, those kinds of messages. Y you decided to do this. Well, it was a hurtful, terrible moment in modern history and speaking out as a human being uh, that happened to be a Jewish person, okay? This happened to Jewish people, so uh, both Alex and I felt it was important to express the pain we were feeling watching this, what could be arguably called one of the worst massacres since World War II of the Jewish people. So it's a complicated issue. I am not a person that wants to be a spokes a spokesman spokesperson for uh, Israeli politics. It's not really about that. It was just a, a natural uh, crying out of, of, wow, this is a terrible thing we're watching, and it's still terrible to watch. Do you want to talk about music? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Critics have not always embraced Rush. Maybe critics often haven't embraced Rush. Um, and radio stations sometimes didn't know where your music fit in. At what point did you and, and the other two members of the band feel like you had made it? You had established yourselves? You, you had achieved the goals that you set out for yourselves? Well, that's a tough question to answer because uh, of our attitude uh, feeling that we still had something to learn, somewhere else to go, we could still be better. From a success point of view, I suppose, by the time we got into the late 70s, we were starting to see the fruits of our labor translate into uh, some sort of lifestyle change <laughs> where we could pay off our mortgages and, and start living uh, uh, a little easier. But um, that was never the goal for us. It was never the driving force behind what we did. Closer to the heart. Yes, closer to the heart. Uh, for us, it was more important to keep improving the show, to keep improving our songwriting, to try to get better as individual players. And that's one of the things that bonded us. I wouldn't go so far as to say that over the years I drove producers and engineers a little crazy, but, well, yeah, let's say I did. I don't want to have to live with errors. Impossible, I know, but what's the effing point of not shooting for the moon? You describe yourself, I don't know if you use the word perfectionist, but it comes out pretty clearly to me in reading the book that you are a perfectionist, even to a fault, I think you would admit, as you listen to the mixes and remixes and remixes of your album. It sounds like a painful process to be working with Getty Lee as you try to get the perfect <laughs> sound. Um, did you ever get the perfect sound? Like, is, is there a, like, do you sit down now at this stage in your life and is there a track or an album you can listen to and think, you know what, like, we, we nailed it? Um, thankfully, I do have moments like that. Uh, they're not all uh, pain and regret uh, listening to the old music. Some of them are like, oh, cringy. But you know, not every song I have participated in writing is a masterwork, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I was most proud of the last album. In the One of the nice things about writing a book is that you get to address 
things that may have annoyed you over the years. And, and I feel like one of those things is, uh, is a misunderstanding on the part of some people of, of the song Free Will. And, and, and you say in the book that, you know, fans can feel the way they want about a song. But, but what bothers you about the reaction of that song is that it has been, you would say, wrongly interpreted as Rush's I don't know, embrace of Ayn Rand um, or uh, libertarianism. So set the record straight on that song. Yeah, and I obviously I'm very proud of that song, and when we wrote it, I was behind it, and I still am, you know, and it does have a lot to say, and a lot of good things to say about choice and about responsibility, but that's the part that some people tend to ignore, and they use the phrase free will as a license to think and do whatever they feel, no matter how hurtful it is, and without consideration of the other people that they're sharing the planet with. But there is a thing called social responsibility that cannot be ignored. And sometimes people tend to use that phrase as an excuse to ignore social responsibility. And I'm not that kind of person. So uh, that was a bee in my bonnet and I got it off my chest. Um, so, so you guys obviously musically were highly respected. Um, I get the sense you were very stubborn as a band as well uh, about this is what we want to do and we're going to do it. I just wonder all these years later when you look back, is there, I don't know, regret's too strong a word, but do you ever think to yourself, man, I wish the 30-year-old me had written like a song that was gonna be number one. Like I wish we'd used all our talents and, and put out a few songs that would be, you know, big we, did, hits. we didn't know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we were, uh, we used to joke and we would look at one of the songs we just finished and say, hey, you know, that could be a hit if somebody else did it. <laughs> but we, are too, we were always too quirky. We were always too rhythmically ambitious, too uh, histrionic in our uh, willingness to add a bit of flash or add a bit of complexity. And that's not really conducive to hit singles. So uh, um, we were just happy with the goals we had set for ourselves and, and accepted the fact that that uh, we wouldn't know a hit single if we tripped over it. Katie Lee also explained why Rush performed with household appliances on stage. His answer is in the full 30-minute interview available on our YouTube page. You can go directly there by scanning the QR code on your screen. A chant used at pro-Palestinian rallies is facing intense scrutiny and an impassioned defense. To be free, it's from the river to the sea. We'll break down both sides of the debate next. A polarizing slogan now heard in Canada and around the world. From the river to the sea. Some call it anti-Semitic. I question where do you see the Jews going? That is hate speech. Others insist it's just a cry for freedom. We're talking about a place that we call home. Those potent words now at the center of a criminal charge in Alberta and condemnation of a U.S. lawmaker. Tom Stagler breaks down why they mean different things to different people. At big pro-Palestinian rallies like this one the other day in Toronto, you'll hear it. Some see it as a rallying cry. Others consider it a call to eliminate Israel. In Montreal, too, you could hear that phrase over the crowd of thousands. When we say we want Palestine to be free, it's from the river to the sea. The U.S. Anti-Defamation League labels it an anti-Semitic slogan. Canada's Federation CJA agrees. When someone says, from the river to, be to the sea, Palestine will be free, I question, where do you see the Jews going? That is hate speech. 
right? Because it is into the sea that they seek to send the Jews. Some say it's more complicated. We can't always assume the, uh, in, uh, the meaning of this or what, how a particular speaker intends it to mean. We'll get back to that in a moment. First, it's worth explaining that phrase refers to the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, including the two present-day Palestinian territories, the Gaza Strip and the occupied West Bank. But calling for a free Palestine in that entire area is often interpreted as a wish to wipe Israel off the map. In the 1960s, the Palestine Liberation Organization demanded the region return to an earlier era with only Palestine extending from the river to the sea. The PLO later embraced a two-state solution. But then Hamas co-opted the phrase as a murderous plot against Israel. Palestine is our land and nation from sea to the river, from north to south, said this Hamas leader, and we cannot cede an inch or any part of it. In its founding platform, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party used similar wording to say quite the opposite. Between the sea and the Jordan, it read, there will only be Israeli sovereignty. To you, what does it mean? When we talk about from the river to the sea, we're talking about a place that we call home. Palestinian-American writer Yusuf Munayer uses that phrase, he says, to reflect the hope of freedom and dignity. He insists the dreams of Palestinians don't have to mean nightmares for Israelis. From the river to the sea today, there is one state, an Israeli state, that rules over millions of people, Palestinians, who don't have equal rights, who are not free. That's what has to change. That doesn't mean that there should be any violence against Israelis. U.S. Democratic Representative Rashida Tlaib posted, from the river to the sea is an aspirational call for freedom, human rights, and peaceful coexistence, not death, destruction, or hate. I'm the only Palestinian American serving in Congress, Mr. Chair, and my perspective is needed here now more than ever. But the House voted to fired. censure her. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free! In Calgary, this activist was charged with a hate-motivated disturbance for encouraging the crowd to chant what police called an anti-Semitic phrase. In an online briefing, Toronto police announced a different approach. I'm not going to speak generally in terms of other chants, but if we're talking about that specific one, uh, no, no, it would not meet the threshold of hate propaganda. The phrase may be considered a rebuke of Israel's policies, but is it anti-Semitic? Dove Waxman says not always. He leads UCLA's Center for Israel Studies. It is clearly an anti-Zionist slogan. Although I don't support a one-state solution, I don't think it's inherently anti-Semitic to advocate for one. It sounds like what you're saying is what it means largely depends on who's saying it and what they mean by it. Is that true? Exactly. And also even where it's said and to whom it's said. So, you know, it's one thing about uh, chanting that in a political rally. It's, um, not, it's another thing, you know, going into a synagogue and yelling it. From the river to the sea, in such tense times, words carry weight. Meanings and feelings count. Perceptions matter. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A metal detector has unearthed a piece of history for Canadian family. You don't really find that many things with names and, and regiments or whatever on it, you know what I mean? The item that was lost and then found 79 years later is in our moment. This is a Canadian pilot service tag from the Second World War. Flight Lieutenant Frank Chad lost it while he was stationed in England. Almost 80 years later, a British man found it, returned it to the soldier's family in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and tonight, it's our moment. So this is the tag that was returned to us. Darren is restoring an old mansion in Stewerhead, England, and he came across this tag that had my dad's name on it. Uh, he did some Googling, he found dad's obituary, and uh, reached out to the funeral home, who in turn contacted us. This is dad's flight bag. 
you might not be able to see it, but it's the same number on the back of his tag, thinking that's his, uh, his service ID. You don't really find that many things with names and regiments or whatever on it. It was exciting for me as well to actually sit there and think somebody's going to be happy if it is this person's relative. It's not just part of the history, it's part of their family. So it would mean more to them than it just sitting in a box here. For somebody to take the time to go that extra step to find the, uh, the family, I thought was pretty amazing. Well, a shout out to that British man who is not a metal detector, but a detectorist. And if you want to see a quirky British TV drama, uh, look up the one with exactly that name, The Detectorists. You can watch The National anytime on the free CBC News app and The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansi. See you tomorrow night.